I want to tell you just a few things. We've been teaching about the Holy Spirit on Sunday mornings for several weeks now. And um, I just want to take take a little bit of time this morning and and talk about this in regards to our life in Jesus. <clears throat> I don't believe any of us have begun to fathom the power and the glorious work of Jesus on the cross. It, it's far greater than us. The Bible tells us that Beings that are more superior than us in wisdom and in understanding are marveling in the wisdom of God to redeem man. The Bible tells us, Peter said, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but to us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. They really study it. It's it's compelling to them. Paul said to those in Ephesus, he says, that now principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And so they look into that. They're amazed in it. And to the Corinthians, Paul said, For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Just a spectacle, just something that people observe. The working of Jesus on the cross is so phenomenal. It is so far beyond what any of us could begin to comprehend That if it were not for God explaining to us in His Word the things that He has shown us, we would not be able to step out into the things that God wants us to live in. Sometimes we might even think, you know, it's sacrilegious or it's dishonoring to God. Peter said that you are partakers of the divine nature of God. Now what man would would just say that, God had to say it. In order for us to believe it, in order for us to try to understand that God does live in us. The Apostle Paul said to the Colossians that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He said, the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now that just simply means you are the Holy of Holies of God. You are the holiest place. He lives in you. Now, we've been conditioned with that for 2,000 years. But try to imagine hearing that for the very first time in your life. Especially to the Jewish people who understood the element of the truth that God was holy and they were unholy. I mean, they were confronted with that daily and yearly by the amount of blood that had to be shed In order for God, who is holy, to live among man that was unholy. And man could not even enter the presence of God. There was distance and separation. For until the time of Jesus, all of the blood that had been shed by the the bulls and and the lambs, it couldn't take sin away. And so though man came before God with his sin, he still left with the burden of that sin. David understood it. He said, if it were sacrifices, I'd offer thousands of them. But God, you alone can make us clean. You have to wash me if I'm ever to be clean. And he understood that. And so God provided a covering for the sin of man. But no man could go into the holiest place where God dwelt. Only the high priest could go there. Not because he was more perfect than the other people, but because God made an allowance for one man to come in there in order to put blood on the mercy seat so God could live with Israel for another year. He allowed it to happen, but that man could not stay there. He could only go in once a a year and he had to leave. Well, something remarkable has happened It had to be one of the most radical statements that the Jewish people would ever hear. And that is the fact that when Jesus Christ was crucified, God not only made a provision for sin, He didn't cover it with His blood, He removed it. He he took it out of the way. 
And God no longer would hide behind a veil and keep man separated from Him, but God would do something more. He wouldn't just come and live among men. Jesus did that in the flesh. But He would come inside of man and He would live in you. That's a radical statement. We don't understand it. We take it for granted. We sing songs about it. We say prayers about it. But we don't comprehend really what that means. Maybe because we don't see it in its fullness. Because it's a spiritual thing. But I'll tell you, angels who do see it, marvel at it. They marvel when they look at you and see Jesus inside of you. They marvel at a holy God living in the, in, in the, in the man who is unholy. They marvel at that. They marvel when they see the corruption of your heart. They marvel when they see the corruption of your thoughts. They marvel when they see you fall every day of your life. Miss the mark of God every day of your life. They marvel that His presence does not leave you. Because of the blood of Jesus, He remains in you. Committed to your sanctification. Angels marvel at that. That we take for granted every day of our life. We do not comprehend, even to the smallest degree, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And what God was able to work in our life. I'll tell you, it is far more than the death and the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Far more than that. He died far more than to just give you life. And He died for greater reasons than to just keep you from hell. The Bible, as an overview of the New Testament, tells us these few things. That you have been raised up with Him. With Him. That means that you sit with Jesus in heavenly places. That means that His authority has been entrusted to you. You have authority because you are in Jesus. That is the only reason. You sit with Him in heavenly places. You have been made a priest unto God and you have been made a king. That means that there is ruling power in your life. There is no power on this earth that is equal to the power that is in the house of God. You are His house. That means in you. If God lives in you, then there is no power on earth that can match the power that's in you. But people who have God must come to this revelation. The Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, he had to know that, and he knew it by confronting everything in life with Jesus Christ and prevailing. So he was able to write that. It wasn't a theory. It was a reality to him. You sit with him in heavenly places. You reign in life by Christ. And as he is, so are we in this world. We are hidden with Christ in God. The Father loves us as much as he loves his Son. Now that's enough to just think about for an eternity. He loves us. As much as he loves Jesus. We studied that last Sunday. Jesus even prayed that the love you have for me would be in them. Well, I can tell you God has honored that prayer. He loves us. God can only love one way, and that's perfect. He can't love you less than he loves his son, because his love is perfect. He only loves one way. We have received abundance of grace. Christ is our life. He has made us alive together with him. Our bodies are fashioned like His. One day very soon, this world is coming to a dramatic end. The signs are everywhere. Even lost men know it. But one day very soon, those of us who know Jesus are going to see Him like He is. And we're going to be just like Him. I don't mean deity. I mean the man Christ. We're going to be just like Him. We are the Holy of Holies. Jesus lives in me and He is Almighty. I can do anything that He wants me to do. The Holy Ghost is within me. He is upon me. He is, the, he is God Himself come to anoint us. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the promise of the Father to all who believe. It is the promise of the Father. Now the Bible says this, I must believe it. I am one 
with Jesus Christ right now. There was a time in my life that sin separated me from God. But as a believer, my sins no longer separate me. I'm not separated from God by my iniquities because the blood of Jesus has brought me near. And it is the blood of Jesus that keeps me near. I'll tell you that Jesus is coming for a spotless bride whose robe is without wrinkle, but nothing can get the spots out but the blood of the Lamb. That's the only thing that makes us holy. It's the only thing that makes us righteous. I wear the righteousness of another. I walk in the holiness of another. And every time I strive to prove to God a personal holiness, He knocks me down and reminds me how unholy I am. And we all fall in that. There are times that you are going to want to be holy You want to flesh it out. You want to live it out. You want to prove to God that you are something. I promise you with all of my heart, as sure as I'm standing up here this morning, and I do believe I'm speaking in the Holy Ghost right now, that God is obligated to knock you down and show you that you are what you've always been and what you always will be apart from Him. And you will never strut a personal holiness around the throne of God. You wear the holiness of another or you're not holy. And that is the holiness of Jesus Christ. And if you love Him and you try to show Him something of what you are, He will remind you of what you are without Him. Your holiness is Christ. Your righteousness is Christ. Your sanctification is Christ. He has done everything for us. He's doing everything for us. And our future all hinges upon Him. That's why we get excited about the Lord. That's why we lift our hands in worship of God. Some people don't understand it because they're dead. God doesn't live in them. They're not the holy of holies. They haven't been touched by saving grace. They're still in their sins. They're very religious. They try to do good, but they never understand the joy of salvation and freedom that we have come to know. They can. Anybody can at any moment by just putting their faith in Jesus. But we have. And so we rejoice in our salvation. This is not a dream. It is not a wish. It is not a fleeting hope. It is the confession of my faith, the reality of my life, and the testimony of the Holy Ghost and the Word of God which has been given to me. When everything in me and in the world says otherwise, this is what I reckon upon. That my salvation is in the sanctity and the power of my Savior who will present me before His throne with great joy. He will present me before His throne through His blood. I rejoice in that and hope in that. I'm as one with Jesus right now as I ever could be in my future. I'm one with Him through the blood of the Lamb. He lives in me. I am His Son, blood bought. And I am everything He's going to make me to be. He's going to make me to be that. I will not make myself to be that. I reckon upon this and I hope in this. We studied last week about David and Mephibosheth. How David, for Jonathan's sake, took Mephibosheth because he was Jonathan's son, who was lame in both of his feet, sat him at his table, and said to Mephibosheth, for the rest of your life, this is your seat at my table. I will treat you as one of my sons. And give back to him all of Saul's fields, all of his homes, all of his possessions, all of his fields, all of his fruit. And I want you to tend to this for him. I want you to reap it. I want you to bring it in. I want you to take care of him. Well, I'll tell you this, that David did it for Jonathan and God does it for me for Jesus. Jesus asked him to do it for me. Oh, Father, let them be where I am that they might behold the glory that I had with you before the foundation of the earth. I will sit at that table in heaven around the banquet of God, and He will treat me as a son. And if I ever asked Him why, He'll say, I'm doing it for His sake. Jesus asked me to do it, and I'm doing it. I'll give you fields. I'll give you homes. I'll give you possessions. I'll give you life. 
I'll have everything in my kingdom watching over you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Whatever deadly thing you eat, it will not harm you. Yeah, I'll give you authority over every devil, every power, every scorpion you'll tread underneath your feet. Because you are mine. My possession. And I love you and watch over you. Faith shouts that it is true. It believes it to be true. I must walk in this by faith, not by feelings, not by even personal experience. Because sometimes personal experience with me may tell me otherwise. But I walk in this by faith that He is mine and I am His. In Romans chapter 7, you find that the Apostle Paul is frequent with despair. He wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't. He knows what God requires of him, but he does not have the power to fulfill it. Without any dispute or debate, in Romans chapter 7, Paul is a born-again man. He's saved. He's been made alive. He has a new man that delights in the law of God. And he has an outer man, his flesh, that always reverts to the evil. I want to do right, but I can't find the power to do right. He's like many of us, and He's like some of us right now. I just want to encourage you in your Christian life to let you know if you're struggling with sin, and you want to do the right thing, you fall in the wrong thing, you keep determining to be right, I want you to know there was a man, much greater than any of us, who lived right there himself. And that was the Apostle Paul. He became so tired of this life. He became so wretched in this. He knew there was something in Christ that would give him freedom, but he never was able to find it in himself. I've exercised my willpower. I'm determined to be right, live right, do right, but I do not find the power to do it. I always end up doing what is wrong. I can be strong for a day. I can be strong for a week. I can be strong for a month. I might be strong for a few months, but I always end up doing what I know I shouldn't do. I don't want to live like this. I want to be holy. I want to walk with God. Oh God, what is going to set me free? Romans chapter 8 is the testimony of a free man. The same man in despair in Romans chapter 7 is the same man in Romans chapter 8 who is free and his freedom had nothing to do with his willpower. His freedom had nothing to do with the knowledge of right and wrong. His freedom had everything to do with the power of the Holy Spirit who kept him out of the desires of his flesh. And if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. I thank God through my Lord Jesus Christ, I am free. That's what he said at the end of Romans chapter 7, because he does it all. And if you're trying to do it, God's going to let you know you can't do it. You may have a few good days, a few good weeks, but you will revert back. But if you will depend upon Him, He will show you, I didn't just save you on a cross to get you to heaven. I'm a Savior every day, every second, every moment. You can't take a step without me. If you only knew how much hell wants to devour you, what Satan has asked of from me to have of you, I have told him no. I have kept him back. I will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able. I will not allow you to be destroyed. I will not allow your faith to be overthrown. I will allow things to show you what you are. I will allow you to stumble if that's what it takes. But I will never abandon you. I will never be unfaithful to you. I will pick you up every time you fall. I will finish what I started in you. What I began, I will complete. I'm not a God who quits. I'm not a God who gives up. When I saw you in your sin, listen, when I saw you in your sin, I chose you because I knew I could make you holy. And I will make you holy. Now that's his testimony. That's what he does. That's what we must believe him to do. And so this is what we have in Christ. Romans chapter 8, you have the free man. He's rejoicing in God. In his weakness, he said, I find there's a presence who helps me. That's the Holy Spirit. And he prays through me with intercessions and groanings that I cannot even utter. 
If God is for me, who can be against me? I know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did ordain and predestinate that they would be conformed to the image of His Son. I know this is happening, and I know it's going to happen. And I know whoever condemns me, let them condemn. But God justified me, and there's not going to be one sin of mine brought up before His throne, because they're all buried with Jesus. That man and did sin. He didn't get away with anything. He died on that cross with Jesus. He was buried with Jesus. And a new man has been raised up. And nothing will be brought against that man before the throne of God. Nothing. He knew it. And so he was able to say that I am sure that not death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any creative thing will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. How does this happen? How does this continue? Faith alone, brother. Faith alone. You never quit believing in the God who saves. You never quit believing in Him. And I'm not talking about dead faith, which a lot of people have. They've got some dead confession. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a living faith that believes Him, is convicted when you do wrong, gets up when you've fallen, walks in the light when you've been in the darkness, because you believe God. You believe Him, and you keep on going with Him. Man would keep you down. But Jesus lifts you up. That's what He does. He lifts you up so much. The Bible says Jesus said it, that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Well, this simply tells me that John the Baptist was the greatest of all the prophets. That's what the Scriptures say. That's what it says. But Jesus said the least in the kingdom of God is greater than He. Greater than He. Now, I believe He's in that kingdom now. I believe that. But I'll tell you, when he was on this earth as a prophet, he was under that Old Testament. He was the end of the Old Testament, the beginning of the New. But he was under that Old Covenant. But in this New Covenant, he doesn't just come upon you with a spirit of prophecy. He comes within you to live. He washes you in his blood. He makes you one with him. You are one. Everything that He has is yours. He shares everything in His kingdom with you. I'll withhold nothing from you. If you have a need, I will meet it. I will provide for you. You will not go without if it's necessary for you to have it. I'll take care of you. I'll feed you. I'll watch over you and I'll protect you. He does all of this for us. But man is so stuck in trying to prove, trying to gain, trying to attain. He's so stuck in that that God... God oftentimes sits back and just waits and wonders, when will you learn that my son did it? He said, one man in this world disobeyed me and he brought a whole race of people into sin. One man's disobedience killed all of you. Well, one man's obedience saved all of you. Just as one man made you all wicked sinners, one man made you all righteous and holy. You either believe it or you don't. It's yours or it's not. One man did it. And that man lives in you. Just like the first Adam who fell lived in you and caused you to live just like he lives, now the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the Holy Lord, lives in you and he causes you to live like he would live. He does that. That's a miracle of grace. We try to earn. We try to prove. And God is trying to tell us it's a gift. You must receive it. By Jesus, you are complete. You are not incomplete anymore. I'm talking about if you're in Christ. You do not begin at the bottom and struggle up. Slowly inch in your way. You didn't do this to obtain forgiveness. And you're not going to do it to obtain righteousness. You didn't start this in the faith to end it in the law. You didn't start this in the, in the spirit to end it in the flesh. You're going to live this life like it began. And you're going to finish this life like it began. Or you will, according to Paul in the book of Galatians. You will fall from grace and your faith will be in vain. You lived this in faith. You received it in faith. You walked in faith. And in faith, it all became literally yours. And so therefore, by faith, in faith, with Christ, 
You will walk in this and it all will be literally yours. This is the way it is. And it will become tangible because it's not faith if there's not obedience to what He says. Jesus climbed the hill, the hill of Calvary. He, he fought the battle. He won the victory and He gave it to you. He didn't say go win. He didn't say stand and on yourself or stand on the church or try to find some place to stand. But He said we stand in His victory. We stand in the power of His might. Everything's been given. We live in that place by faith. We live in it by faith. All is there. To the very least in the kingdom of God, we are commanded to walk as Jesus walked, forgive as Jesus forgave. We are to give thanks in all things. This is the will of God concerning you. You are to rejoice in everything. And again, I say rejoice. You are to be holy as He is holy. Well, I can only tell you this, that the good man and the religious man must hang his head in shame, realizing I will never be able to attain that. And he will continue to try, and he will never make it. But the saved man will hang his head, not in shame, but in thankfulness, that this God lives in him to be holy. And this God lives in him to make him a forgiver. And this God lives in him to make him thankful, and to give him a reason to rejoice. There's a complete difference in all of that. Christ brings into the church all of the wealth that He has. He brings it in to the church. He brings it into here. He brought fullness to us. John 1 says, And of His fullness have we all received in grace for grace. His wealth as far as people. Why live a bankrupt life when you can live a full life? You don't have to. Be in spiritual poverty. God is not glorified by spiritual poverty. He's glorified in fullness. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. By His fullness, I can do all things. I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. So does Jesus worry? Why should I? If He doesn't, why should I worry? Is He invincible? So am I. So am I. Because whatever He is, He is to me. And so that is my portion. Therefore, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say that I can see. It's more than a song. It's the truth of the gospel. I'm not poor if I'm in Christ. I am not blind if I'm in Christ. I'm not weak if I'm in Christ. Whatever He is, He is to me. That's what He is. In Colossians chapter 1. We just get through all the introduction. Now we're going to our scripture. Just getting started. Colossians chapter 1. I want you to see something very, very important. A wonderful truth here. In Colossians 1. Verse verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of, Of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now listen to this. So wonderful. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's instant. A translation. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether there be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things and by Him all things consist. Now notice this. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And so in Jesus, there was absolute fullness. In chapter 2 of Colossians, if you would notice with me in verse 9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, 
and you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Complete in Him. Nothing He withholds from you. I just want to cover this for just a moment. And you think about for a minute, what would you pay for this? In our country, it is a multi-billion dollar, if not up into the hundreds of billions of dollars, business The treatment of people with antidepressants. People pay huge sums of money for peace of mind. That's just medical treatment. We don't even get into the arena of the happy hours at the bar where people will go sit and try to find happiness in a few friends and a few bottles of beer. The multiple millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars that are spent upon drugs, both legal and and illegal, medical, and what other ways we can. Man striving with all of his might to have peace, to have joy, to have sanity. All of that. I mean, that has. I'm just trying to bring it into perspective because we treat so lightly what God gives so freely. He gives it so freely. Listen to me. You are complete in Him. In Him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus had fullness of joy, fullness of peace, fullness of rest. He was never disturbed. He was never confused. He was never confounded. He was in absolute control and peace of every circumstance He was ever in. And the Bible says you are complete in Him. Do you need peace? He's promised it. Do you need joy? He said, my joy, I give you. I'm not going to just tell you how to get it. I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll just I'll just give it to you. Do you need wisdom? Ask me. I'll give it to you. I won't chasten you. I won't rebuke you for it. I'll just give it to you if you just ask me. Because everything that I have, everything that I possess, everything that I am, you're a joint heir with me. It's yours. I want you to know it. It is yours. I'm not stingy. I'm not greedy. I don't run out. Because it's not in a vault. It's not in a bank. It's not on Fifth Avenue in heaven. It's me. The never-ending reservoir of peace and joy and power and wisdom. It's me. I have all grace. I have all love. I have all patience. I have it all. and And I give it all to you. And in the Word of God... Are the promises for fellowship. You'll never be lonely. For authority. You'll never be weak. For guidance. You'll never be without some help. Without direction in your life. If you're in me. I have promises for those that are discouraged. I have promises for those that are confused. I have promises for those that have gone into rebellion. Because I am a complete and all sufficient God. I know how to recover you. And I can recover you. I have promises for those for jobs. I have promises in my grace to give abundantly. If you're afraid, I will. I, I promise you my perfect love, which will deliver you from all of your fear. If you have troubled times, I have promises for your marriages. I have promises for your finances. I've made promises to heal your bodies. I have promises for widows, promises for wives, for adults, singles, children, husbands, the elderly. I have promises for all of you out of my abundance. I have promises to deliver you, to fulfill you, to make you rich, to deliver you from depression and condemnation. I have promises to deliver you from anger, from doubting, to make you obedient. I promise to give you peace, forgiveness, security, your daily needs. Power for your loneliness, your temptations, and your grief. I have promises for every aspect of your life that you will ever experience in your life. And far beyond that, if anything ever was created that you had to deal with, I have a promise. And that promise is me. I will never leave you. I am that I am. Whatever you're in, I am. I'll do it. I'll be there for you. I'll be sufficient. I'm full. Never ending. We have to believe that about God. We have to know that about God. Now, back here in Colossians chapter 2, he tells us this, that we are complete in Him. And he tells us in verse 10, you're complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, By the circumcision of Christ, 
buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He made the show. He triumphed. He spoiled. We didn't. We're just more than conquerors. I remember a preacher that came here to the church many, many years ago. And he said, what is it to be more than a conqueror? And he described it like this. He described it as Sugar Ray Leonard going into a a fight and he wins $10 million for the fight. And he conquered and he gives the wife the paycheck. Well, she's more than a conqueror. She didn't have to fight. She gets the prize. And he said, that's what it's like for us to be more than conquerors. We didn't fight. We didn't go to the cross to fight our sins. We didn't go to the cross to fight principalities and powers. We didn't go to the cross to do these things. He went to the cross for us. He fought for us. He fought our sins. He took the law, which is good, nailed it to his cross, fulfilling it. He fought Satan. He fought principalities. He fought powers. He triumphed over them in the cross. He made a spectacle of them before the universe, hanging between God and man. He did it. He won. And we are more than conquerors because we get the prize of his victory. Everything he died to win, we're given. We're given. It's just yours because he did it. And we go around saying, this is too good to be true. But it is true. And it is good. And it's better than any of us could ever imagine, but it's true. I just want to sum this up. In Him, all fullness dwells. And you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principalities and powers. You are circumcised in Him. The sins of your flesh have been put away. They're not being put away. They have been put away. If they were being put away, then Jesus would still be on the cross. He would still be suffering for sins. He'd still be paying the price. But the Bible says in Hebrews, he suffered for sin once and for all. He did it on that day, one day at Calvary, 2000 years ago. He's not on the cross anymore. He's not a perpetual sacrifice. He's not paying for sin day after day, week after week through sacraments and ceremonies. He did it. It's over. It's finished. My sins have been put away. I have been circumcised. I have been circumcised by his flesh. His flesh was torn. His flesh was wounded. God, in the old covenant, to give a shadow of what was to come, entered into a covenant with Abraham and demanded that Abraham and every male child of the Jewish race would be circumcised in the foreskin of their flesh. And this would be a sign of the covenant, the cutting of their flesh, the circumcision of their flesh. But it was a symbol of something that would cut more than that. And it would be far deeper. It would be more costly. And it would require death. And it would require the shedding of all blood. And not just some of it. But not all men were called upon to bear this. One man was called upon to bear it. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was not just the foreskin that was circumcised. It was His whole self. It was His whole blood. It was every ounce of life that He had was poured out dramatically on a hill in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago so that I could be circumcised and I could be in covenant with God and my sins could be removed. I have been circumcised with Him. I have been buried with Him. I'm risen with Him. I'm forgiven in Him. Everything that's against you was nailed to his cross. So what's against you this morning? Is there a fear that you have between you and God? Is there something you've done that you're afraid of that God may bring up? Well, listen, take the faith that God has given us in the book of Colossians and understand this. Lee, if it was against you, I put it on the cross. If it's against you, I put it on the cross. You cannot fulfill the law. 
The law wasn't against you, but the law was your judge. In that sense, you couldn't fulfill it. It would testify against you. So I fulfilled the law and I nailed it to my cross. It's not against you anymore, son. Is your sins against you? I nailed them to the cross. They're not against you anymore. They've been answered. They've been paid for. Nothing. Nothing. What could be against you? I nailed it to the cross. It's not there anymore. Satan wants to tell you it's there. Your conscience wants to tell you it's there. Guilt wants to tell you it's there. But I tell you, who are you going to listen to? You just read it in Colossians. I took it out of the way. It's not in the way anymore. It's not in the way. He has bought you with His blood. If God is for you, who can be against you? If God has justified you, who can condemn you? And why has all this come to us? Why are we full? Why does He take everything that He has and shares it with us? Why does He give so abundantly? Why does He lavish so fully? Why does He give you more than you can contain? I watched a video this last week. I can't pronounce the guy's last name. Louis Giglio. He he puts out some very wonderful things, but he did a thing on the universe and just how vast it was. And there was there was a there was a photograph of our of our one of our cameras we sent out by NASA at the edge of our of our solar system, our galaxy. And it took a picture back this way. I don't know how those scientists are able to do it, but when it was near the edge of our galaxy, they sent it a command to turn around and take a picture back at the Earth. And it turned, and, and that camera turned around and snapped these hundreds of, of, of camera shots back, and, and it took months for those signals to get back to NASA. And they put it all together as, as a picture. And on that picture is this blue speck that has to be pointed out. You'd never spot it. And you see the vastness just of our galaxy. And there's trillions of galaxies out in the universe. Unfathomable space and distances between these galaxies so that they don't all collide into each other. And there's mass confusion in the universe. And this blue speck in the middle of a universe is the only blue speck, the only planet, the only thing where God stepped into and became one of us. It is here that life exists and it is upon this planet that God created His prized creation. It is on this planet that He made something in His image And he breathed his life into it and said, of all of this universe, you will be my habitation. I'll live in you. Amazing. And I think about the vastness of this God, all that he has, all that he possesses. And you know why? Not only for your personal benefit does he share all of this with you. But he does it for Christ's sake. He wants us to be his witnesses. And I take us back to one of the great purposes of the great God of creation coming to us in Acts 1, verse 8. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. This great, almighty, all-wise, all-present God said, I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to come upon you, and I'm going to clothe you, and I'm going to live in you, and walk with you, and I want you to be my witnesses, because I love this world. I love this world. I love it so much, I'll make the ultimate sacrifice. And when I save you, I'm going to take everything that I've got and I'm going to freely give it to you.
Don't be selfish with it. Freely you've received. Freely give. Ezekiel stood over a valley of dry bones. Represented the dead nation of Israel. It represented a hopeless situation. If Ezekiel were most preachers, he may have studied to get a message. And he may have spoke and said, well, it's the truth. And the dry bones would not have been affected one bit. But he wasn't a typical preacher. He walked with God. And standing there over death and impossibilities, Ezekiel communed with God. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, can these bones live? And he said, you know. And the Holy Ghost said to him, prophesy. And he prophesied what the Lord put in his mouth. And dead bones became alive. In our generation, we stand over something far worse than dead bones that are dry and accumulated in a valley. We stand among dead souls, deaf ears, stubborn and rebellious hearts. Our day does not afford itself the luxury of putting life on cruise and trying to get as much out of this world as we can. Our world is perishing. The ends of the world are upon us. And God says, I have a cause. And I want you to go into this world. And I want you to prophesy to it. I want you to speak my word. And just like I did for Ezekiel in that valley. If you speak my word, I'll move on that word. And I'll touch rebellious hearts, deaf ears, blind eyes, dead lives. And I'll begin to raise them up. We don't have time to waste. We don't need preachers. We don't need echoes. Of people saying what somebody else said. We need people to speak. What they've heard. Because they've walked with God. So what does that mean? That he's done all of this so you can walk with him. He's given you his spirit that you might live a supernatural life. First of all, believe that he's given it all to you. In that belief, receive it. And once you've got it, give it. Walk with Him. It's all about to end, guys. Everything you're chasing is not going to satisfy you. It's not going to sustain you. It's not going to take you from this life to the next. But everything you do for Him will be forever. Every soul saved Every testimony, every sacrifice, every idol abandoned will be an eternal work to the glory of God.